All right. Welcome. Welcome to the joint webinar series with the IEEE Power Electronics Society and the IEEE Transportation Electrification Community. Thank you for joining. Today we bring to you high density motor drive design for electric aircraft propulsion, what we might know and what we don't, presented by Fe Dr. Feng Liu from Stony Brook University. First, we have some housekeeping announcements. Today's webinar will be live and is being recorded and will be placed on the TEC website and the PELS Resource Center within the next week. We invite you to use the questions functions on your panel to ask any questions you may have regarding the content or any broadcast related issues. Questions regarding content will be answered verbally at the end of the webinar. Information on how to request a PDH certificate has been sent to you via the chat feed function and will also be included in the follow-up email you will receive within one hour of completion of the webinar. I will now welcome Dr. Liu so he can begin his presentation. We hope you enjoy the webinar. We'll get started in a moment. All right, thank you all. Thank you all for your time for um, attending this webinar. My name is Fang Wu from um, Stony Brook University. I'm currently associate professor at Stony Brook University and I'm the director of Spelman High Voltage Power Trans Lab. So let's get the presentation start. So before we start, the, um, let me move this around. There we go. So before we start, um, I would like to uh, express my appreciation to Ohio Federal Research Network, OFRN, Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, NASA, National Science Foundation, ERC Center Poets, and um, NASA ULI program, CHITA, here, Center for High Efficiency Electrical Technology for Aircraft, as well as my um, previous employer, the Ohio State University and University of Arkansas. And um, I would also like to express my uh, appreciation to all the references, valuable re references from um, NASA, University of Tennessee, Knoxville, University of Nottingham, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, University of Wisconsin-Madison, University of Houston, and Virginia Tech. Uh, what I learned is all from their excellent work here. And the whole presentation here is contributed by a lot of my uh, um, current and previous students, including Dr. Mo Dashpande, Dr. Zhao Yuan, Dr. Balaji Narayan Sami, uh, Dr. Yaling Wang, Mr. Injo Chen, Mr. Asif Iman, Mr. Mustafiz, um, Mr. Hushan uh, Choksi, and uh, Ms. Anusha, uh, and Ms. Um, uh, Yu Chen Wu. Okay, let's get started. Right here. Here's the outline here. I have a little bit about 40 pages here, but uh, basically the entire presentation covers my five years, six years now, six years uh, um, research on um, uh, all electric aircraft propulsion systems. I wish I have a full day to cover every detail that we um, we have um, uh, been working on in the past. There's a lot of fun things to share and a lot of uh, failures as well as maybe minor success stories, but um, I only got that much time. So uh, if you are specifically interested in some of the details, uh, you can raise your hand and we can bring that into the discussion. So the overall presentation includes three sections. We have we will cover the background first and then we'll have the primary problems. When we talk about primary problems, which is um, like um, every power electronics engineer will think about what is the architecture for my power conversion and how do I design a really nice power converter for this application. But then actually uh, we are we have to start looking to secondary problems which usually we call that side effects of your power conversion because this is a brand new concept it's an emerging tech, um, uh, application here so we're really trying to fly a big battery or electric powered aircraft in the sky with uh, even 300 seaters on top of that. And what, what is the consequence if you're deploying such a significant amount of uh, electric power on board and start doing a switching power conversion on board? Uh, how can we make sure this is a reliable system? So all of those, I, I put them in secondary problem discussion here. And then we'll go into summary and discussions. 
Okay. So for the background, I don't think I need to um, over describe that much, but as everyone has seen, electrification has been happening from the land to sky. It does help to, as, as you can see here, we have now um, ele electrical freight system and uh, electrical um, cargo system. And now we're really trying to fly all this uh, uh, electric powered machine in the sky. And by doing that, we really hope to reduce the no X emissions, CO emissions, CO2 emissions, SO2 emissions, and all this kind of a poison gas emissions. And uh, we can potentially also reduce the acoustic noises in the sky. And the potential benefit is that uh, hopefully if we design the system right, we can have a better reliability and it's easier for us to do the maintenance because you don't have to deal with the uh, a lot, massive amount of uh, uh, hydraulic line anymore. And also uh, by um, achieving all these goals, we are seeing the potential of uh, fly cost reduction by going into um, uh, full electric aircraft systems. So again, I'm quoting a famous chart from NASA here. There are four different types of uh, uh, all electric propulsion systems. We can directly go with the battery powered uh, a motor motor drive plus motor here to fly your aircraft. We can also do a turbo electric, which you have you still have a turbo engine here. Well, the turbo engine is not going to provide thrust power to the airplane, but it's only provide the uh, um, um, power as a prime mover to the generator, and then the generator will distribute the electricity across the airplane and use this electricity to actually um, drive all these big fans. And also we have a parallel hybrid and series hybrid configuration here, which is, um, I usually use this analogy to our electric cars. It's a similar concept. You can put your battery in parallel with your uh, gasoline, and uh, not gasoline engine, but um, fossil fuel engines, or you can put them in series. So uh, in this case, your um, uh, fossil fuel um, engines here, uh, turbo um, fan here will still provide some of the thrust power, well, the rest part of the power are coming from the electric power here. And to really achieve the goal of that, we have a large flying machine. NASA put out this um, um, specifications here in their 30 years roadmap. They would like to see that um, um, you know, in a really near future, 2035, uh, there will be a power rating higher than two megawatt um, motor drive plus motor with their efficiency higher than 99.5%, and with their specific power higher than 25 kilowatt per kilogram. So when I, when the first time I saw those numbers, that was in 2015, I'm shocked as a power electronics engineer, because uh, I've never seen anyone proposing such a crazy specifications and ask them why you have all these numbers. And they eventually tell me that those numbers are not from the electric engineers, these are from the system engineers, because from the system uh, planning point of view, um, if you want to really fly such a machine with such a high power inverter and, and um, uh, motor on top of that, you need to be this much high efficient. Otherwise, your cooling system will be overweighted and um, you will never take off your airplane in such a manner. So, so the driver behind this is how we're really going to have, have this platform happen and how we really put this platform together to accomplish this mission. Okay, so the state of art, right after that, a lot of um, um, companies as well as universities are working on this um, um, really aggressive goal here. Uh, in this chart, I'm only quoting the development in the United States. There are also really nice work from Siemens from uh, other countries, including Singapore, and um, uh, the entire European Commission has a lot of effort on that as well. Um, due to the page limit, I'm only um, putting the de major development in the United States on this chart right now. So in NASA's goal here, they're trying to get uh, achieve some of the power, uh, I mean, the power rating higher than two megawatt per um, uh, two megawatt here. And the efficiency is higher than 99.5% and power density is 25 kilowatt per kilogram. So General Electric actually had two generations of design here. This is their first generation. Uh, both of them are one, mag, um, one MVA design. And both of them achieved the efficiency higher than 99%. Right? 
with quoted 99%. And this is their first generation lab prototype. And uh, uh, the power density has achieved 12 kilowatt K, um, kVA per kilogram. And the second generation reaching this tiny box is uh, one MVA monster here. This one achieved 25 kVA per uh, kilogram. At the same time, the University of Tennessee at Knoxville, they are looking to cryogenic motor drive systems, reach the design target as one MVA, but everything has to be in the cryogenic cooled environment here. So um, they also achieved 99% efficiency with uh, 18 kVA per kilogram. And uh, Robert Pilawa from UIUC at that time, uh, he's now with uh, UC Berkeley. <clears throat> he also proposed a really innovative design using the state-of-art gallium nitride devices. And he demonstrated 200 kVA design here with an efficiency of 98.6% with a specific power of 15 kVA per kilogram. So again, the major challenges here, efficiency and power density, you need to have both of them. Okay, the question is that how do I have this high density and high efficiency in the same um, building block, which is my motor drive? <clears throat> so there are two ways to go with that. Um, in, across the entire analysis, there are two different technology trends here. One is let's just do ambient temperature power conversion because we know, we probably know how to do that because it's, it's basically the power converter we're designing every day, except we're going to fly that. And the key uh, takeaway for such a design is that you need to have high frequency, high efficiency power conversion on top of that. Otherwise, you are not, not able to shrink the size of, of your power conversion system, which is the motor drive. <clears throat> so to get there, you also need the help from advanced power module packaging and finger cross that you will have all the right devices you need. And as you can see that for um, NASA scope, um, they really want to go beyond two megawatt machines and it's possible to have multiple machines on the same aircraft for those large uh, major liners. So long, I mean, long distance liners. So for that purpose, um, basically Ohm, Ohm's law will kick in here. If you want to transmit um, higher power, then in ambient temperature, you have to raise the power system voltage to much higher voltage. Otherwise, you will need to use really big uh, power conductors on aircraft. And uh, with the increasing of power con conductors, this really means that um, your aircraft is going to haul a lot of metal just to conduct all this uh, current in, in, in their system. So that's not a um, practical way to go with the higher power applications for that. So people are thinking that, why can't I just go with uh, much higher voltage? And um, I forgot to mention, all those designs that I'm showing in the state of art, their input voltage is much higher than one k kilovolt. Well, the state of art um, aircraft power system is powered by plus minus 270 volt, which in total is 540 volt. So we're doubling, tripling the voltage here to get the right current and voltage we want for all the load. But then what is the consequence of that? It's basically we're bringing a medium voltage or a high voltage power grid on the aircraft and we're going to elevate this power grid to 30,000 feet. So the direct consequence of that is there's a lot of uncertainty for um, EMI problems because now we're seeing much higher DVDT and DIDT on board. And second, second problem is that um, all this high voltage doesn't matter if it's a DC field or AC field or sometimes it's a PWM PWM excited um, um, square wave um, field that will all induce a failure for your installation system for aircraft. Really means that um, if you don't pay attention to that, your aircraft can have uh, all this uh, uh, um, corona issues, break, voltage breakdown issues at a higher altitude, uh, where when that happening, um, if you're flying your aircraft, there's no way you can park your aircraft somewhere else. So there's another approach that we can go after, which is cryogenic temperature power conversion here. With this kind of concept, we intend to do a high current power conversion instead of high voltage, because now I can freeze everything in cryogenic temperature. The key takeaway here is that your aircraft is better to be powered by a fuel cell so that you can use liquid hydrogen on board. And liquid hydrogen is a fuel, equivalent to the fuel, but it's also a really good coolant. And in that way, if you can cool everything 
per se everything, including your motor, your power conductor, as well as your power electronics converter inside a um, cryogenic temperature, you can potentially take the advantage of um, superconducting system and pump as much current as you want into the conductor without hitting the limit. In this way, you don't have to increase a lot of your um, power system voltage and you're avoiding some of the high voltage induced problems here. But then here comes the question, how are you going to design such a system operating in, um, in a really lightweight fashion while um, everything, all the electronics and power electronics has to operate in a low temperature environment? A second question is that, what are the failure modes in such a cryogenic um, operation system? And how are we going to mitigate that? Because those are less common to see in our daily life. So I'm fortunate uh, to actually work out on both uh, cases. Uh, um, the project that's supported by Ohio Federal Research Network, uh, that one was on the uh, ambient temperature power conversion system. And currently I'm um, part of the team led by UIUC, uh, sponsored by NASA ULI program, um, we're also looking to cryogenic power electronic system design here. So my basic approach as a power electronics engineer, uh, basically I'm heavily relying on model-based design and analysis here. What does that mean is that I know that I have different types of uh, uh, power switch configurations, uh, we call that um, <clears throat> topologies. And if I know what kind of heat sink I'm going to choose, what kind of um, component I'm going to use for these links and output filters, and how am I going to build my um, output filter, which requires, say, a virtual physical design. And I know, since I'm designing my own power converter, I know how to do the modulation of my converter. And I'm going to look after all different types of um, device options from the market. And I can accurately represent its switching as well as conduction performance during the normal operation. And this information can uh, provide you um, loss information, including switching loss as well as conduction loss. By further looking into this kind of time domain analysis, you can actually also extract the loss information for, from your filters, from your diesel link capacitors. And then based on all this information, you can choose, make the right choice for your heat sink. And those models are pretty accurate. And you can actually do a iteration on that to um, generation by generation to improve your model accuracy. And by doing that, you can actually use such a, such a kind of a flow chart here to do a loss and efficiency estimation. By doing all this, you can actually find the right topology for your application with, a, with different input voltage and different output voltage. The optimal design point will be different, which I'm going to show you later on. And also uh, with this kind of uh, information, you can choose the right um, module and right device numbers and choose the right modulation index and modulation scheme as well as the uh, switching frequency. Okay, so now let's get into the power architecture discussion. What do I mean by power architecture? Basically, it means that what kind of power source I have on board and how will that impact on my different stages of power conversion? And what is the best combination of all those power conversions? Because apparently you can have different input power here, which means uh, you, for your input diesel link, you can have 540 volt, 800 volt, 1000 volt, or even going beyond that. And from the load side, you can have um, different motor designs. Um, I'm just making two, picking up two numbers here, assuming that I have line to line voltage of 300 volt and 600 volt. How should I design the intermediate power electronics converters here. How many states should I use and what gives me the best benefit? This is the purpose of this power architecture discussion. So again, what we did is that we actually um, <coughs> exhaustively list all the possible combinations which can satisfy your input and output spec. And then we list all, some of the really typical topologies here, as you can see later on. And then we're, we're using the model-based design approach to, to conduct the trade-off between the efficiency as well as the voltage and volume here. And uh, our hope is that we can arrive to the optimal converter topology by doing this kind of swinging. 
And this work covers both uh, uh, ambient temperature power conversion as well as cryogenic power conversion, but more focusing on cryogenic power conversion here. I'll tell you why that's the case. <clears throat> so to get there, if I want to link the input voltage and output voltage here to make sure I have all those lines crossed out together, I have two different approaches. I can use single stage power conversion means in cryogenic system, as I mentioned, if I want to go with a fuel cell, and most of the time, the input voltage, um, by far, we haven't seen really application going beyond 1,000 volt yet. It's practical to have 500 volt and, and maybe a little bit about that. Even going 800 volt, um, there may be something that we don't know because uh, we don't really know how what kind of failure mode will happen to a fuel cell if I stack too many of the cells together. So to keep on the safe side, um, the uh, um, the knowledge we have from the existing systems that, well, it will be nice if we can have like 540 volt DC input here and we can take care of everything. So in this case, if I only have one single stage power conversion, then uh, I'm just putting a DC to AC converter here to connect to my motor. Of course, if I'm using the battery bank, I might be able to increase this voltage, much higher voltage here. Or if I have, for example, if I'm using turbo, electric propulsion systems, then um, I can actually fine tune my generator to make my DC output to be 1,000 volts here. So those cases, if I have 1,000 volt, I'm well covering both cases here with single stage power conversion. But if I'm running an input of 540 volt, yet I want to support 600 volt output here, I do need two stages. So I need a DC to DC stage and also need the DC to AC stage. Assuming this system is 2.5 megawatt, so everything that I'm designing here will be according to um, 2.5 megawatt. So we, we made some assumptions here. For DC to AC converters, we are really looking to three different types. So it's a two-level VSI, three-level VSI reaches a TMTC topology here. And specifically, we're looking into a two-level current source inverter. So current source inverter has been really popular last century, what, around the time when I was born. But um, after that, since the, um, um, because of the development of the, um, um, IGBTs and other uh, modern power devices, it's kind of taking over by voltage source inverters. And Rockwell has been really successful with uh, um, CSIs, but the rest of the world are mainly working with uh, VSI. But right now, since we're really looking into such an interesting application here, CSI may give us some of the um, hidden features and hidden advantages that we want to see. So we also include that in our analysis. And this will be our power conversion topology here, which we have the input bank plus the uh, single stage power conversion to the output stage, which is over here, connecting to my motor. And for the... <clears throat> Two-stage power conversion, we're mainly looking to those combinations. So if I have a low voltage input, we are having a boost stage in front of that. Of course, there's a lot of tricks that we can play with that. But right now, I'm just making a case here using one single stage boost inverter here. And if I have a high voltage input with a low voltage output, I can use a bus stage plus another whatever we want. So we're making a CSI here as this kind of... Uh, uh, um, uh, to show this um, um, concept here. So in this case, we also have our input uh, which it either from fuel cell or by battery bank to our output motor here. So a couple of the assumptions here, um, all, a boost type intermediate DC to DC converter is considered for VSIs and bus type intermediate uh, or first stage DC to DC converter is considered for CSI. So we're trying to keep DC link as 1,000 volt here for all the VSIs. Well, we're trying to keep the diesel, um, well, equivalent diesel link or input voltage here to be a plus minus 270 or 540 volt um, um, as the input for our CSI system. Because your CSI inherent the benefit of, of having an um, um, output gain higher than one. So those are the simple conclusions feasibility analysis that we have here. If I have my nominal voltage input at 1,000 volt, and if I want to achieve 300 volt here, 
I mean, all the voting sourcing were can do the job. And 800 volt DC, 540 volt DC, all of them can cover the output of 300 volt. However, if I'm moving from 300 volt to 600 volt here, I only have the choice if I'm going with single stage VSI op uh, operation. I only have the choice going with uh, uh, 1,000 volt diesel link. That means you have to increase. You at least you need to double your diesel link voltage to make that happen. And for this uh, 2 2 m 2.5 MVA uh, calculation example here. However, if we're going to um, do um, power conversion for two level um, uh, with uh, two level current source inverters here, and if I want to supply 600 volt, I don't have to use two stage power conversion. I can just use single stage. As I said, CSI is inherent with the function of boosting up your output voltage here. However, it cannot step down because now uh, if I want to support 300 volt applications uh, with a single stage operation, I'm not able to do that. I have to use another stage of bulk converter to step down the voltage in order to have a lower output at the output of the CSI. So what does those two tables tell me? It really tells me something like this. If I'm going to see the different combinations, and if I run the same, if I assume that I'm using the same uh, power device in our analysis here, we use the silicon carbide device as well as gallium nitride device um, as the example. I'm, I'm going to use the Coase uh, gallium nitride device 650 volt uh, as one of the calculation example here to show our calculation result, which is that if I'm doing the 100, 1000 volt DC to 600 volt AC power conversion, with a three-level VSI, I can achieve 99.68% efficiency. Those are ideal efficiencies just coming into the uh, losses from your uh, semiconductor. If I'm going to do um, 540 volt DC input, I have to go with a single stage two-level CSI. However, my efficiency will drop to 99.41. But if I'm going to use a 540 volt input to get to um, 300 volt AC output here, then uh, my efficiency will further drop as an indicate that you need another stage to step down your input voltage. I mean, I'm sorry, you don't have to use uh, another stage, but you are actually changing the operating point of your uh, converter. So you're losing approximately 0. Point something, 0. 0.06 percentage of the loss if you're moving from 600 volt AC to 300 volt AC output here. If I'm going to use 800 volt DC to generate uh, 300 volt a, um, AC output here, my efficiency is around 99.33 if I'm going with a three level VSI. And if I'm stepping down from um, a higher voltage here, obviously I'm losing my efficiencies. And if I'm trying to use a um, 800 volt DC to support six, 600 volt AC output here, and um, my flow efficiency will actually get down to 98 because you do need to you, you do need two stage of power conversion here. Okay, this is the first step. We got our efficiency numbers, which is arbitrary, assuming uh, we have all the right models for the device and we did everything right in calculation. And the beauty of this code is that actually we use a MATLAB code developed by our own lab. And um, we use this um, model-based design code a lot, which I learned from Johan Koller from ETH. So um, <clears throat> by using this code, um, maybe some of you have to doubt that, well, how can you make sure that this uh, um, double digits after dot is correct? And, and how can you make sure that this is the right efficiency that I'm, I'm interpreting? Don't worry about that, because this is more like a comparative study. If I make one mistake, I'm making the same mistake across the entire screening process. So the ranking of the results still might still, uh, might still be right. So with that, uh, with doing that, we actually went ahead and designed all these major components other than power, uh, power devices in the system. So we designed the diesel link uh, capacitors, diesel link inductors, as well as output filter uh, uh, capacitors and inductors here. And we actually interpreted 
all those numbers into their uh, real number based on the energy balancing and uh, voltage ripple and current ripple uh, in the system. So we did that for two level VSI. We did that for three level VSI. We did that for um, two level CSI. Now I have all the inductance and capacitance number here. What does that tell me? Does that directly tell me uh, what is the size of that? Not yet. Now is the time for having um, good students um, to ask them to put all this design into a physical design. So my students actually went ahead, other than building the inductor and capacitor, they actually virtually designed all those inductors and capacitors on a piece of paper. With all the geometries and dimensions using off-shelf components and, and devices. And it turned out that the results are quite different. Why I'm saying that it's quite different? It all depends on if you're operating in um, cryogenic temperature or not. If you're not operating this in cryogenic temperature, what, what you can see is that actually with a high current DC link inductor here, the inductor size as well as weight can be significant. It will be much heavier than the rest part of your system, including your cold, um, cold plate and thermal management system. If if you are not running in cryogenic uh, operation. So in ambient temperature, we still consider that VSI in nature gives you the best uh, efficiency as well as its power density in ambient um, temperature power conversion. However, magic doesn't happen to capacitor if you are lowering the temperature, but it does have it does have some magic to your inductor designs. If we can freeze my entire inductor uh, power converter in cryogenic temperature, I don't have to use any um, magnetic core there. What I just what I need is a superconducting coil, and this coil I can pump as many ampere amperage in there as possible. And I can actually um, in, um, um, have a really high inductance and energy store in this kind of uh, air coil. So in that way, you can reduce your weight and size of your converter design. And in that case, you can beat the power density and efficiency using a CSI, um, beat the power density from a VSI using a CSI. So, but how can I systematically represent this kind of result we're, we're really trying to scratch our hand because there's too many variables their efficiency their volume so we thought of one way is that why can't we just generate another figure of memory for uh, our power converter design so we simply take our efficiency divide that by the volume which is the percentage divided by the uh, liter here so we just map all this volume metric calculations with the uh, 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 efficiency that we mentioned in the first place. And we found out that actually, if I, if I have access to, to a cryogenic power conversion here, the best figure of merit from the power converter combina combination will be from 540 volt DC to 600 volt AC uh, power conversion. So I can use a, a little bit higher voltage motor here, but still keep the same low DC distribution voltage on the power system. And in this way, I'm only going to use one single stage uh, CSI here, which is a two level CSI to realize this power conversion. And this gives me um, the best figure of memory, which is close to one. So this is some of the uh, interesting work that we worked on the uh, power architecture for all electrical aircraft systems. And another thing that I forgot to mention is that uh, um, EMI performance, because CSI actually inherited a lot of uh, good features of uh, um, a reduction on the um, shaft current, um, shaft current, which is common mode current. And because of, uh, because of the nature of CSI, eventually you are not seeing that much high DVDT across the system. So your uh, EMI noise compared to a to the same rating v VSI, your EMI performance is much better. So you are generating less EMI noises. Um, if you're going to use a two-level CSI compared to use a two-level VSI here. So two benefit, um, less EMI, lower input DC voltage. Okay, so with this kind of uh, power architecture analysis here, 
what we really do in our daily life, um, we're still in the process of designing and prototyping and lab prototype for the cryogenic CSI for, uh, um, uh, for our NASA project. But prior to that, we did um, a couple rounds of uh, attempts to design and co-optimize and um, motor drive for um, ambient temperature um, applications. So those are our co-design co-optimization procedure here. Sorry for the typo. So um, the first thing is that we would like to use a power transmuting block uh, concept here, um, and we can design a modularized power converter. So that's that will be helpful if you want to swap out one of the unit, and or even if, if you want to put more unit on top of that. Uh, again, our approach starts with uh, model-based design selection. We need to determine what is the right uh, topology that we want. And then we go with the module um, evaluation if we're using the off-shelf modules. And then we com combine all this information into our own knowledge and start our boss bar design and optimization. For doing that optimization, we need to do a co-design with uh, thermal mechanical stability is here. So basically this part of work are uh, collaborated with my previous colleague from University of Arkansas, Dr. Uh, David Heiting here and with his team. So we went around um, a couple rounds of uh, this kind of co-design procedure. And then we designed our own uh, beauty block here and start testing. So the target for us is that we want to demonstrate power density, uh, uh, um, cool power of 450 kilowatt and efficiency higher than 99% with a specific power higher than 22 kilowatt kilowatt per kilogram and power that density is higher than 160 watt per cubic inch and switching frequency higher than 30 kilohertz. Uh, the reason why we want to switch at a much higher frequency than existing motor drive is because the load, which is the uh, high high speed, high density motor, usually they come in with um, much less um, inductance. So you need to have a good um, high switching frequency um, in order to reduce the harmonic influence to the motor itself. So our major challenges here includes holistic design and op optimization of the entire system here. And we're also seeing the module and system level packaging challenges, which I'm going to cover the module challenge later on. Insulation and EMI control under extreme environments also challenging here and device limitations. You don't have that much, uh, you don't have that many choices. So eventually we went ahead and designed two generations. The first generation is what I did uh, under support by Ohio Federal Research Network. It's a hybrid uh, structure here. When I say hybrid structure is I'm using the high current IGBT in parallel with a uh, high switching frequency, but low current uh, silicon carbide. Because this prototype was uh, built in 2015. At that time, the best uh, um, silicon carbide power module I can get is uh, 7, 1700 volt. 200 amp from ROM. Um, so I, I still want to de demonstrate a high efficiency power conversion at 450 kilowatt ish. So we don't have that many options to do that. So um, I decided to go with a uh, paralleling a silicon carbide MOSFET and silicon IGBT here. So the silicon carbide MOSFET will um, switch during the switching transient. And this silicon carbide MOSFET will actually take care of all the dynamic current while the IGBT will actually carry all this um, on um, conduction current here, which is much higher. So in this way, I'm actually making a switch which is soft switching IGBT here, and I can achieve um, switching frequency at 30 kilohertz. And this prototype, which is built by Amor Dash Pande, uh, we achieved 27.7 kilo, kilowatt per kilogram, but this is excluding all the EMI filters and cold plate. And the efficiency is around 98.6 percentage. And then later on, under the support by uh, National Science Foundation poets and the uh, University of Arkansas, and, and um, um, it's, um, my lab is close to wolf speed. So I have access to their latest um, development of HD3000 1.7 kV power devices. And what's better that what's better is that actually uh, sorry I forgot to mention both uh, based on the module uh, model based analysis we choose to go with the T type NPC topology for both uh, for both designs. So actually here is the main switch and both those two are the clamping legs. And when I moved to Arkansas, 
since I have access to um, the common source modules built by WolfSpeed, that makes my job much easier. So we had a second generation Silicon Carbide MOSFET uh, design here. And this footprint is almost half of this design. And we actually um, use three of those units and make a demonstration of uh, 450 kilowatt. The highest peak efficiency is around uh, half of the uh, uh, design capacity here. So we did a continuous test at two, uh, 266 kVA with switching frequency of 70 kilohertz. And we achieve um, power density of uh, 35 kilowatt per kilogram. And if it, um, I think the efficiency number is 99.4 something. Um, yeah, the number actually comes into next page. So the other thing is that to further reduce the weight of the system design, what we want to get rid of the metal cold plate here, which is a big bucket of your uh, system weight. So I, again, worked together with my colleague, um, Dr. David Heiting, and we thought of a replacing this cold plate using a 3D printed non-metallic, basically it's plastic uh, cold plate for the system. So since I'm replacing this with a plastic piece here, I'm losing the benefit of removing the heat from the uh, metal surface. Uh, but Dr. Heiting, he has a really innovative design, so he put jet impingement right into the uh, channel here. And we have a small nozzle underneath each of the power dies and spray water onto the backside of your power module. And in that way, we can realize the same uh, uh, heat removal capability. Well, we're getting something else because now I'm replacing the auto metal using a pl pl plastic piece. I'm eventually increasing the common mode loop impedance. So I'm gaining 22 dB uh, benefit on EMI reduction. And we did, again, this is a co-design work here. Um, just with my electrical head on, I, I'm not able to get there. So this is the final converter that uh, we tested in the lab. So we have three unit of the power uh, building blocks here sitting together. And we have our control interface plus sensing board right sitting on this side here. In this version, you are still seeing a cold, I mean, an off shelf code plate here in this design. And we did a continuous test and uh, found that actually all the design is uh, uh, very well handled and all the temperature didn't go beyond what we expected. So this is good. And so right on top of that, once I replace my oops, sorry. Once I replace my off shelf code plate, which is the aluminum piece with the uh, additive manufactured plastic 3D printed code plate here, this is the footprint on top of the, the, the top module here is exactly the same what we have, but the bottom size here is much more uh, reduced. And with that same, we are seeing a weight reduction about um, more than one kilogram because of uh, removing this uh, heavy metal piece. And on top of that, we're seeing the benefit of uh, EMI reduction, specifically for common mode noise reduction, by replace this uh, metal cold plate using the plastic cold plate here. Okay, as I mentioned that, one of the key issues is that I need to have good power devices. However, I don't have much options. I have to go with whatever power device supplier give me. But even with a good device, if you don't do a smart package of them, you won't really get the efficiency and power density that you need. So we also looked into those problems. As I mentioned that the Imperial's case, we're using two off-shelf um, IGB, um, power modules, which this one is the IGBT and this one is ROM silicon carbide module to build this high power density converter here. But later on, I was thinking that why can't I just do that myself? So my student Namo actually went ahead and did this uh, new design here. So we designed our own hybrid power module here, which those two big devices here, they are silicon IGBTs. And the small tiny device here, this is a silicon carbide dies. They're sitting on top of the same substrate. However, they're laying out in, in the way that you have the P cell and N cell on the same substrate. And we are rerouting all the gate signal using the PCB sitting right on top of the ceramic substrate so that it can help you to decouple the um, coupling between the uh, power loops as well as your uh, gate loops. 
And those two other real modules that we built, uh, fabricate and use in the facility um, at University of Arkansas, which is a high deck. And um, we actually test um, um, multiple rounds of this module. This is one of the older, older results. Uh, we test up to 50 amps. In later testing, we actually went, um, we went ahead to uh, 300 amps. And there are two different types of design here. One is designed for 650 amp, the other one is designed for 300 amp. And in this design, we also did a lot of uh, co-design, co-optimization here, because if you want to make sure the module works, you need to have your thermal analysis here, which you need to make sure that your uh, um, silicon IGPT is cooler than the silicon copper, because silicon copper can take high temperature, but your silicon IGPT cannot do that. And with this kind of a different temperature distribution, you also need to look into the uh, um, displacement deformation of the uh, power module, so that during the operation, you won't crack your module. And we did all that. On top of that, as I mentioned, uh, we also looked into using um, filling full silicon carbide solutions for such kind of design. So two of my students, um, Dr. Zhao Yuan and uh, Dr. Um, um, Mr. Asif Imam, they both of them want to design their own power modules. So I have two modules here. One module is we're using the hybrid package, which I have a ceramic substrate underneath that. And we have all the power dyes on top of the ceramic substrate. And we have another layer of PCB as the routing layer sitting right on top of this uh, ceramic substrate so that you can bring the top interconnections to the adjacent pad to shorten the overall loop inductance. In that way, we achieve the overall top loop inductance about 2.4 nanohenry and the overall loop inductance is 8.8, uh, sorry, 4.8 nanohenry here. And we actually conducted the uh, uh, full-scale um, uh, power testing, continuous power testing on this power module here. And you can actually run this de um, design with uh, almost zero gate resistance with turn on and turn off DVDT. Turn on DVDT is 40 volt per nanosecond. Turn off DVDT is about um, uh, 30 volt per nanosecond. And we only see the turn on overshoot with 9% uh, and turn off overshoot is about 2.5%. Um, similarly, ASIF came up with another design, which we replaced the uh, um, PCB, but now we are using two DBCs here. And the, we, the top DBC is carrying all the power devices, while the bottom DC, DBC is actually serving as a return loop for all the power current. And in this design, we achieved the overall loop inductance for some loops is 4 nanohering, and overall, overall loop is about 8 nanohering. Um, I put 150 amp um, here is because we only test up to 150 amp and we, we, we put a um, smaller device in there. But the overall thermal capacity of this module is the same as the previous one. Um, we can handle much higher current in such a power module. One of the unique thing is that the bottom DBC design, we have uh, some of the pattern on top of the uh, bottom DBC. And, and eventually those DBCs, if you connect those um, uh, copper part in the right way, you can actually mitigate the EMI and have much less EMI emission from this module. Okay, the last part, secondary problems, partial discharge and EMI, EMC and reflective waves. What we have been doing is that, um, I mean, um, it just uh, probably a lot of you already know that partial discharge is something induced by high voltage. Well, is um, totally different if you test this on a ground level at the higher altitude, because at the higher altitude, you have lower pressure. So on ground level, you, your um, breakdown voltage probably somewhere here. But if you keep depressure system, your, um, actually your um, breakdown voltage is actually reducing. So such a curve is called passion's curve. And only when you go beyond a certain point, it's more like running into vacuum, your uh, um, breakdown voltage will go up again. So our job uh, scope here is trying to understand what is the consequence of such a design and how I can actually have a PD free or PD less design for my um, system here. So we eventually built such a partial discharge testing platform in our lab. We have a high power source over here, and we have our own high voltage switch here, which you can switch 
or either provide DC excitation or low frequency AC excitation, or we are also generating PWM, uh, high voltage PWM excitations to the testing specimen here. And this is vacuum chamber and this is a vacuum pump here. So you can actually pump out and control what is the pressure inside this uh, um, chamber and see how will this actually uh, influence on your breakdown voltage. So something interesting here. So we did some tests for uh, we we did some tests for um, uh, uh, PCB and use use different design patterns here. So we did round pad and square pad pad. And if I have a pad close to the if I have a pad close to the um, place here. Um, sorry about that. So, uh, so the conclusion is that um, for the PDIV, the wrong pad has higher. For, for the wrong pad here, um, we have higher uh, PD inception voltage than the square square pad, and the um, trace corner will have uh, much um, um, uh, lower PDIV compared to all the other designs. And this will eventually change if you have a different pressure here. So one of the video shows an interesting thing here. If you start depress depression, um, depression the system, as you can see, there's a spark, corona start actually igniting across the trace here. And everything actually you can feed that into the pa um, um, passion curve equation here and use that as a design gui um, guidance for the pre pitch and um, Installation design for PCB at a higher altitude, power PCB. Another thing is that uh, for most of the IEC standards that for our testing, um, they're only regulating using a either a DC excitation or low frequency. When I say low frequency, it could be 50 hertz or 60 hertz excitation um, to um, to actually uh, check your system. But in a real power electronic system, you're not really using a DC or uh, 60 hertz sine wave. So we actually built our own high voltage PWM switch here and want to understand how will this PWM excitation influence on the partial discharge as well as other type of uh, high voltage induced breakdown in your system. And we eventually went ahead and used a scalable op option here. We use uh, a lot of uh, silicon carbide JFET plus one of the gate control found here, and we build a super Costco structure. And this is what we learned from Dr. Alex Huang from uh, UD Austin. And once we have this kind of uh, configuration here, we actually put everything in uh, transformer oil to avoid a partial discharge just from this board by itself. And then we actually test our um, samples over here. Um, somehow, if you're doing this test in a, a switch mode operation or PWM operation, it's really hard for us to detect the PD event because there are two parts of current. The first part of current is actually the uh, uh, um, displacement current. If your insulator is right here, you can consider it here is a capacitor. So you always have charging, discharging current going through this if you're shooting the square pals across the DUT. And this displacement current will actually get mixed with your partial discharge current. And if you're only using a, um, a Pearson probe or plum meter to gauge how much space charge you have, you won't be able to read, separate them. So we actually combine this uh, detection with some of the EMI research. In interestingly, we noticed that different insulators will have different EMI signatures at different frequencies. Put in a simple way, if I have if I have a solid, uh, per se, if you have a silicon or epoxy insulator there, you will see a high frequency uh, unipolar signature at about three gigahertz. So that three gigahertz um, discharge signal is actually um, um, relevant to the partial discharge event, which is easy to separate from your EMI background noises. So we eventually went ahead and used this hot, super high frequency detection. And uh, we built our own antenna here and use the down mixer. We pick up this uh, um, three gigahertz signal down mixing that. And then we can input that to a 
a low pass filter and um, input that into our scope. Use that way, we can actually capture the PWM induced PD event in such a system. There's also other types of um, uh, observation that we notice basically the space charge uh, um, during this kind of partial discharge event, um, your PWM sign signature will actually influence on the space charge and further if you change the space charge in your um, insulator, you will see a difference in the E field distribution and which will make your uh, um, which will make your uh, um, E field distribution in the insulator totally different. Okay, so we actually did the same thing for the um, bus bar, and because in previous case we want to have a really low inductance bus bar, so we actually have a banded design with all this uh, uh, different um, structures. It, it's actually a five-layer bus bar. So in this way, we actually have a, um, a lot of uh, um, um, ununiform distribution of the um, 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 electric field. But however, in our um, uh, installation design, we actually encounter all these kind of challenges here, and we actually develop our own PD-free um, area for a different uh, um, air pressures. So with that, we provide this information to our bus bar manufacturer and ask them to enhance uh, where you should enhance your uh, insulation film and where you should actually put more uh, epoxy. And we have our bus bar back and, and everything works well according to our testing. Um, a quick run through of uh, EMI reflected wave testing. Um, I, I have been given this kind of talk um, previously, but in our um, uh, aircraft systems were mainly doing the testing according to EO160 uh, testing setup. So this is basically how it looks like if I want to have a long cable testing in my lab. Uh, this is basically we have a ground plane going from one end of lab to the other end of lab. And we have our silicon carbide power converter sitting on one end. The long cable goes all the way to the other end and on the other side is the uh, load simulator. And in this way we can do different types of Testing, we can do conductive EMI testing, but you need to make sure that your cable is standing off the ground with 10 centimeter support. In our case, we're just using paper towel row. Uh, of course, you can you can get something else to do that. And and another thing is that in um, in um, all electric propulsion systems, since you're running such a high current through this cable, and along the cable, usually you will have other signal cables and signal conditioning cables across the entire cable here. We also want to understand how will this power cable influence on other cables. That's why we're also doing a near field probing here, which we have our near probe state, uh, station sitting along this cable and do, um, do here is the robotic arm. So we actually can map out all the near field radiation from the cable and determine which area I should avoid and which area is safe and how much magnitude we have over there. On the same um, plot, we can also see different um, testings with the uh, reflected wave, which I'm going to show in the next page. So this is a little bit introduction of the near field uh, testing setup here. We um, all these are designed by uh, Stephen Imam, my student. So basically, we have a DBOT, which is a robotic arm in our lab. We connect that with the uh, Arduino, and we have a computer here with lab wheel. So lab wheel will control the Arduino to control to synchronize the DuBot and the spectrum analyzer. So it will tell DuBot to stop at a certain point and the spectrum analyzer will take some of the measurement. Of course, over here on the tip of the DuBot, we have our near field probes, which connects to the spectrum analyzer. So in this way, we have an automatic mapping system like this. So uh, it worked out pretty well. So um, for the reflected waves, as, as you can see that if we if I have a um, power converter over here connecting to the long cable with my load on the other end. This is the uh, um, basically the switching waveform you can capture at the output of your converter over here. With a shorter cable, in this case we're using one meter cable, you don't really see a lot of resonance between the load over here. This is a, the yellow is a load voltage. But now if I increase that to seven meter cable, you can see that I have much higher voltage across the other end. However, if you can do the right matching 
For example, in our case, we try to use RC matching network at the low end. You can actually reduce this kind of overshoot. So before you do that, the blue actually shows one of the testing without doing the um, load end impedance matching. But once you start doing the load end impedance matching, the blue will turn into a green, like what you see over here. Okay, so yeah, one last chart here. So with a uh, high power cable going around the system, uh, we're also interested in how will this cable um, generate power noises to the um, communication cables here. So we did the modified induced noise testing here, which uh, during the full power testing, we have our communication cable around here terminated by 50 ohm and the other end connect to the spectrum analyzer. And this is the signature that we picked up over here. This is the load current that you're seeing. Well, this is actually what we are picking up from the uh, uh, sing signal uh, cable loop over here. So a simple a summary here, power current induced noise can actually damage your, can fry your uh, signal circuit over here if this spike gets too high. And the coupling coefficient is determined by the signal cable loop and the orientation as well as the grounding of the system. So as a summary, uh, we still need a lot of systematic effort to determine the right architecture for all electrical aircraft propulsion systems. Obviously, wideband gap device is the um, key enabler. Uh, we need to pay a lot of attention to all the side effects because they will eventually become the bottleneck for the system. And as I said, um, I share a lot of what I might know and what I don't know, but I feel that a lot of more yet to be discovered. All right, thank you for your time. Great, thank you, Dr. Liu. Um, as a, uh, we would like to thank Dr. Liu for his time. Please use the question function to ask any questions we you may have during about his presentation. We will now start answering questions that came in during the webinar. So if you can just undock the question feature. And then just make sure that the show answered questions, um, you unclick okay. that. Yeah, I uncovered that. So the and first we'll question. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say we're going to take just only a few questions because we are at at the twelve o'clock time slot. Um, and then any questions that weren't answered, um, I will send Dr. Liu a um, Q and A report so they will be answered after the conclusion of the webinar. Okay, I I get a bunch of questions here, but for some reason it's not all showing up, and and it's all crammed into a small window here. I, I will try to answer that one by one, okay? Okay, What kind great. of load do you use to measure the efficiency? What efficiency be different um, with an actual motor? So in our testing, we're, we're using RL load for most of the testing because uh, my lab, I don't really have a 450 kilo uh, KVA um, 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 actual power supply to that. So we have to do a power situation. Um, this is a good question. Will the efficiency be totally different from the actual motor? To our analysis, we don't expect that because um, um, for the RL load configuration, we already run the converter at its worst uh, power factor. So supposedly it should rep represent the worst case. But uh, I mean, this is why we're still having the project. I'm working with uh, Professor Kiel Baharan from UIUC. Uh, we're still trying to put two of the system together and run together and see if we will expect anything different. Okay, the second question here. The structure design was supported by using some numerical simulation tool. Um, this is a really excellent question. Uh, yes and no. So we 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 heavily rely on Maxwell, uh, Maxwell and as well as all the finite element analysis tools but the structural, initial structural design is actually done by a kind of model-based design tool developed by my own lab. So basically, if you know what kind of uh, inductance and impedance you need, you can actually project that into a kind of, uh, uh, you, you want a, a micro strip like this, or you want a piece of trace like that. And with that, we can visualize something uh, um, close enough to what we want. And then after that, you, you, you need to take that conceptual design from there and then uh, put that in the actual design. So uh, we did use some of the help 
but but um, imagination is still important. Okay, um, here's a question. Thank you for um, the presentation. I was wondering, how did you calculate the parasitic capacitance in EMI a measurement for comparing VSI and, VSI and CSI? Okay, so basically, um, if you don't have your converter yet, we can have some um, um, major assumptions here because we know what is the uh, parasitic from your power module, what is the cable, what is the uh, layout probably look like. So with that, uh, it's easy to gauge a number around the neighborhood. But if you have your actual design, you, you have to do a um, parasitic extraction, either use finite element analysis, or you can do a offline uh, um, impedance measurement. So I do have a EMI class on that. And if you're interested in that, we can actually have another offline discussion on that. OK. Uh, Another question, I would like to know if possible, which is the tool used to estimate EMI impacts? So uh, basically, we use our own tools here. Um, we, we do have an um, open source tool, which is, uh, um, just make sure you email me. We, we have our own um, software here, if you have um, all the information in the power converter. And you can actually, it's basically sim simply Ohm's law. You can actually, um, Simplify your common mode and differential mode EMI noise sources and capturing uh, relate all this kind of uh, high frequency readings according to the double pulse test that you have or um, either simulate from simulation or actual testing. Another tool that I can think of is that um, you can use LT Spice or um, Saber. Those two are, those two software are my favorite, so we use that a lot too. How will the compare cost for different voltage and ambient time? But that you got me here. I don't have a cost comparison yet because uh, for the entire cryogenic loop design, this is a totally different monster. And this is the major scope for Cheetah project, as I mentioned at the very beginning of the presentation. Uh, that's a NASA ULI led by a uh, uh, University of uh, Illinois, Urbana Champaign, um, Dr. Phil. And so he's the lead PI on that. We're working with uh, Boeing and General Electric, Ohio State and US Air Force um, together on this subject and trying to figure out the information um, as much as we can. So Dr. Liu, can we just take, we'll just take one more question. Okay. So this okay. will be the one last question and, and uh, I will try to answer the rest question by email them. I'm wondering why two switches are used in CSI. I think it's actually one switch and a uh, serial style. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, we're trying to do bidirectional power conver conversion. That's the first point. Second point here is that uh, we're using gallium nitride device for such a configuration because we want to, um, um, this is specifically designed, as I mentioned, that we only see the benefit of using CSI at the uh, cryo temperature. So, at that temperature, you don't have many choices. Either you go with a silicon device or you go with a gallium nitride device. Uh, silicon germanium, um, you can't really use that for power conversion. Silicon devices, I mean, people have been demonstrated that. So now we're going after um, gallium nitride. Okay, right. great. Thank yeah. you so much. As a reminder, information on how to request a PDH certificate has been sent to you via the chat function and will also be included in the follow-up email you will receive within one hour of completion of the webinar. For information on additional webinars, please visit the PELS and TEC websites. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you all for attending. All right. Thank you all. Have a nice Thank day. Thank you. You we'll too. Bye-bye.